take our Bibles and um, let's uh, turn where we are in our study of the book of Revelation. We're studying chapter by chapter and we've now come to chapter 7 of the book of Revelation, chapter 7. Now as you're turning there, and particularly if you are a visitor with us here this morning, I want to make sure that you understand how we are approaching the book of Revelation and really kind of how we from the the very beginning started reminding ourselves of how we should think of this book because how you think of this book determines everything about what you understand as you begin to unpack the chapters and the verses that are there. And so you will remember that some time ago I gave you a chart at the very beginning. It's called the Redemptive Story of Progressive Parallelism. That sounds like a mouthful, but it simply just means this. When you open up the book of Revelation, what I don't think you should do is to read it like a chronological story. If you read the book of Revelation, like chapter 1 must mean it leads to chapter 2 and 3 and 4 right on through, you're going to get confused as you work your way through the book of Revelation because you're working through thinking, well, this happened, this happened, and whoops, it looks like we're back over here to the same stuff I just read just a few chapters ago. Rather, I think that the way to approach the book of Revelation, and it makes most sense to us today as well as those very first century Christians when they got this letter from the Apostle John that God had sent to them, I think the way to read that is to read it more in a parallelism kind of a way. And what I see in the chart I gave you kind of unfolds for us is that the book of Revelation on seven different uh, kind of ways or cycles or different uh, opportunities tells us things that we need to know uh, as believers between about the first and the second coming of Christ. In other words, everything in the book keeps unfolding for us what we need to know between this period called now and later. We, we now know the Savior. He has come. He has died for our sins. We've remembered that this morning in the celebration of the Lord's Supper, but we know the story is not over. He's going to come again. So in between that period of time, there are things that the book of Revelation will help us to understand and help us to think about. And as it unfolds those cycles and those different uh, unveiling of these things we should know, each part of the story helps us learn a little more about how we should think as believers between the first and the second coming of Christ. In fact, by the time you get to the end of the book and chapter 22 don't hold your breath I don't know when that's going to be but when we get there you will have from these seven different cycles this parallelism this progressive story that keeps building you will have a full picture in your mind as to how you should think as a believer between the first and second coming and so I'll just leave that chart up there for just a moment to remind you that what we've learned is that in those first three chapters Christ is in the midst of his church And there's very little debate about that. Everybody believes that that's really what's going on there. Christ is evaluating his church. He is inspecting it between the first and the second coming. And and he's seeing things that he encourages them about and, and things that he challenges them about, sin that they need to deal with, that they are not dealing with. And it really is a great, great, great look at the church. And there's all kind of promises that are given in this uh, uh, passage here, uh, these first three chapters. He tells them that they are going to overcome, that when they overcome, they will eat of the tree of life. They will have a crown of life. They'll never be touched by the second death, which is eternal death. Uh, He won't ever erase their name out of the book of life. And he's going to confess them before the Father. And they're going to one day sit down with him on the throne with him. And reign, co-reign with him throughout eternity. Now, if you're like me, and if you just read those first three chapters, you got all kind of questions in your mind. Questions like, are you kidding me? It doesn't look like that's happening. It looks like the world is falling apart. In fact, it looks like it's not getting better. It looks like it's getting worse. And so after the first three chapters, which gives that first cycle, it then moves in to the second cycle between chapters 4 and 7, and it lets us there see that Christ really is on the throne until eternity returns again and that he is going to begin to take control over the entire world he will get it all back and so as we've learned through those chapters there there are some seals that are there there are seven seals 
And in those seven seals, uh, the Savior just one at a time keeps breaking open the seal, uh, claiming back the earth, the right to the earth, and, and revealing that he does own this earth, that it really is his world. And no matter what it looks like between the first and the second coming, there is a day coming when he is going to absolutely make all things right. And it begins in chapter 4 by unfolding in this next uh, cycle here, a picture of the church ultimately being triumphant. And we've studied those in detail. Now, if you will remember, and you're right there in Revelation 7 there, how the very sixth seal in these seven seals, we made it to the sixth seal in chapter 6. If you look at verse 17, that sixth seal, you remember, is about the day of God's wrath has come. The first five seals have unfolded all kind of tribulation on the earth and all kind of struggles that are going on and things are just coming to uh, a conclusion. They're unraveling. But when you come to the sixth seal, what you have here is this kind of cataclysmic moment happening. And where the mountains are moving, the earth is trembling, the sun is turning black, stars are falling out of the sky. And then you'll remember right at the very end, it says that the sky was opened up and it's a picture of the parting of the skies for the Savior to return. And when he comes, just like he has been promising all through these sealed judgments, he is going to bring judgment on the earth. He is going to answer the cry of the martyrs who in that fifth seal kept saying, Lord, how long is it going to be until you really put things right? And so the story keeps on progressing. And in the sixth seal, when that day of judgment and that wrath on the unbelieving, ungodly world, those who have have rejected the lamb and run from the lamb and ignored the lamb, when that day comes, we end it in verse 17 with this question. For the great day of their wrath, that is the wrath of God and the wrath of the Lamb, has come, and here's the question, and who is able to stand? Now watch this very carefully. This is why I want you to read the book in a progressive parallelism way because just as when you read about the church and all these promises and this great triumph that's coming, and you go, well, how's that going to happen? You start seeing that in the next cycle, chapters 4 to 7, unfolding. So when that sixth seal comes and you see wrath coming, there's another question. The question it is asked at the end of the sixth seal, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I have a question. If that day when you come is coming with wrath and vengeance on those who do not know you, and um, we haven't found yet, and <laughs> our first our study of the first six chapters where the church is gone yet, the question you would obviously ask yourself is, how are we going to be able to stand in that day? What's going to happen to us as God's people? If the day of wrath has come and God has promised to us in 1 Thessalonians 1.10 that he will save us from the wrath that is coming, the question you've got to ask yourself is, then who can stand? How will we stand? How will we be kept safe from this wrath that has been spoken about in chapter 6? And so chapter 7 becomes the answer to that question. And so in chapter uh, 7, what you find is that this is a passage that really speaks to us about 144,000 people And we're going to learn who they are this morning, but it's important that you understand, even before we get to answer that question, who they are, it's important for you to understand that there is a purpose in this chapter. And there really are two purposes, if you'd like to kind of jot them down. First of all, there is the purpose of answering that question that I told you in uh, chapter 6, verse 17, when he says, who can stand against this day? Who can make it through this day? And so chapter 7 is going to answer that question for you. You'll you'll not have a doubt in your mind as to who is able to stand. You know that those who will not stand are those who have not come to the Savior, who have not turned to the Lamb. And so it does answer that question for us. The second purpose of that chapter is to assure God's people. It not only answers a question, but it assures God's people And if you notice in chapter 7, verse 3, and we're going to read the whole text in just a moment, he says, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. So what we're going to discover in the chapter is, okay, who can 
stand in the day of wrath? And the answer is it's not those who have rejected the Lamb because they're going to be in severe trouble when the wrath of God unfolds on the earth as the Son of God returns. But he wants to assure us that nothing ever will ever, ever sever us from his protective care and love no matter what happens with the rest of the world. In fact, you know the passage, don't you, in Romans 8, verses 35 through 39. It kind of gives you another application of thinking about this from this whole aspect of the coming of the end and and God's wrath falling on the unbelieving world and, and how he protects his people. Listen to what Romans 8, 35 to 39 says. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Now, remember, we've seen those all the way through the first five seals that have been broken, right? Every one of those. He says, just as it is written, for your sake, we're being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we are overwhelmingly conquering through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so most of us tend to think of that verse only in your day-to-day troubles and your day-to-day trials and struggles, and it is applicable to that. But I think we can equally, as we read this passage And as we've said before about the study of the book of Revelation, it never says anything new in the Revelation that the rest of the Bible hasn't already said. What it does is it clarifies it and it makes it more understandable to us. But it doesn't say anything new we haven't learned. And so we're going to see not only this question answered about who can stand, we're going to discover in a profound way, whoever these 144,000 people are, that they have an incredible assurance that nothing can separate them from God's protective care regardless. So, having looked at that, let's think a little about who are these people. Who are these people? I mean, you read in the text there, and I'd like to read that for you. And it sounds like it ought to be real easy, but for some people it doesn't seem easy to figure out who they are. Chapter 7, verse 1, after this, I saw, it's his way of introducing something he hasn't told us about before. I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. And from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. And from the tribe of Levi, 12,000. And from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. And we're going to spend our time this morning now trying to figure out who these 144,000 are that are sealed by God. And what does that really mean? And really in the end, uh, I'm going to hopefully drive this home to you some real, to, for some real practical application to your own life and for encouragement. But when you approach a passage like this, you know, with a number in it, uh, it's one of the, it's the first, it's the number we first come to that really puzzles people in the book of Revelation. You know, the other one's going to be the 666 number, right? That's the one that's going to puzzle everybody. We're going to look at that as we get to chapter 13. But here you have 144,000 that are listed. And you would not believe how many ideas people come up with about who these people are. And it really just kind of kind of amazes me that they've come up with some of these suggestions when all they have to do is just use the Bible and they figure out real quickly who it is. It's not hard. But there are those 
who say that these that are rep- represented here in Revelations 7, 1 through 8 are aliens from the planet Venus who were brought to earth. Now, I know you probably have met some of them, and uh, you run into them on the earth here. There's some strange creatures. I understand that. But uh, this really has no validity at all. In fact, I just really as a sidebar would tell you that uh, any kind of con- consideration or thought that there might be aliens and from other planets and stuff like that, you just go ahead and throw that in the garbage can because that's not even possible. You know why that's not possible? If that were possible, the gospel would no longer be what it is. You see, the gospel says that God created the world called the planet Earth. And he created the earth perfect and righteous and it was glorifying him and it was all perfect. Then man sinned through Adam and Adam brought death to the whole entire world. So all sinned in Adam. And who does the Bible say that Christ came down from heaven to die for? He came down to die for Adam's race. He came down and is actually called the second Adam. And so there's no promise anywhere in the Bible, anywhere, that Christ died for anybody else other than people living on planet Earth who come from Adam. Now, there may be strange and bizarre things going on in our world, but uh, there's not another group of people or race or alien group out there. And you can take the book of Ezekiel and all the books you want to and try to turn those visions into flying saucers as much as you want, but that really has nothing to do with extraterrestrial beings. But that's what some people think these 144,000 are. They're people who are souls brought from the planet Venus down to earth. Then there are those who, like the seven-day Adventists, who say that these are true believers who keep God's law. Uh, They've kind of softened up a little bit on that, but if you just dig into their website, it's not hard to figure out that what they mean by that is that those who are the true believers are those who meet on Saturday and keep the Sabbath. Um. And so everybody else who meets on Sunday, they tend to be the ones who are not the true believers and therefore they're not sealed and protected by God. Now listen very carefully. There's nothing wrong with having worship service on Saturday, right? I mean, you can have worship service Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And some churches just for functional purposes need to have services all weekend long. So there's not anything wrong with worshiping on Saturday. The problem is, is when you attach worshiping on Saturday as a keeping of the law which earns your salvation. And that is what Seventh-day Adventists would tend to lean to when they think of who the 144,000 really are. Then, probably the most familiar ones around you are those who come to your door and they are the Jehovah's Witnesses and they think that they are the ones who are the pure believers. They're the ones that are redeemed. They're the ones that really are sealed and, and they're safe. Now, immediately when they came up with that interpretation of the text, they ran into a real problem after they got a more, more than 144,000 members. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> but never fear, they've got that all figured out. So what they've done is they have created these bands There's a heavenly band, B-A-N-D, and then there's an earthly band, 144,000 in in the heavenly band, and 144 can be in the earthly band. Now, I know some of you never thought there were going to be bands in heaven, but that just proves it right there, that there'll be bands in heaven, okay? And so the problem, though, with that is that they've already exceeded the 288,000. So now we got another problem. So now they have a band of servants, And so they keep adjusting and keep coming up with how to interpret who the 144,000 are. And again, I am somewhat amazed at all the convoluted ideas that people tend to come up with to try to make sense of this passage. We can just open the Bible, we can let the Scripture interpret the Scripture, and it won't be complicated for us to figure out. So that's what I want to talk to you about at this text here for just a few moments as we kind of Uh, take the next 20 minutes or so to wrap up our service, I really want you to just follow me with two points here about this. I want to, first of all, as we think about this vision of the victors, because they are victorious, and as the rest of the chapter 7 unfolds, it becomes very obvious that they are in a celebrating mode, and they are rejoicing in the Lamb and what He has done to save and rescue them. So I want us to kind of work through the first eight verses this morning with two points, and we're going to, first of all, look at these four angels who pause the winds of God's judgment. Look back at verse 1 again. He says, After this, 
I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Now, I just got to park there for just a moment, okay? This is the, a favorite verse of liberals, uh, people who don't believe in the inerrancy and, the, uh, and uh, the inspiration of Scripture. They look at that and they go, poor, poor John. Here he is 2,000 years ago, and he thinks the earth is flat and has four corners. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. And that extends to you and me. You know, we're so outdated. We don't believe in true science, they would say. And really, we just, uh, uh, we're just kind of caught up in a mythological kind of belief that there really is uh, a flat earth of four corners. So we tend to say, well, you know, listen, don't hold it against John. I mean, come on, all oh, shucks. He's just, he's just a, a guy out on a, on a rock somewhere. He didn't have any idea what he was writing, maybe. That's what people try to just soften that, that down when you read that. But the reality is that if we say John is not writing accurately, we just attack the inspiration and the inerrancy of Scripture, didn't we? Because the Scripture says that there are four angels on the four corners. We've got to figure out what that means and what that's about so that we understand that God did accurately speak about it. Because really, just to say, well, that's not true. The Bible says there's four corners, but... We know scientifically there's really not. Then we just really attacked the sufficiency and inerrancy of, of Scripture. So what does he mean by the four corners? Well, in my studies this week, I found that there is a, a science called geodesy. And uh, as I was reading about some of the sciences, what that is is a, a branch of applied mathematics that determines the shape and the size of the earth and a lot of other things. And so in geodesy... Uh, they have actually discovered scientifically in recent days that there is something like four corners or four points to the earth. Listen to what one scientist wrote. He said, The earth is not really a perfect sphere after all, but it's slightly flattened at the poles and has an equatorial bulge caused by earth's rotation. It has a bulge around its middle. Now, you all know what that looks like, right? <laughs> You get the picture, right? Flattened and a little bulge here around the middle. Okay, I'm going to move on. I won't camp there long. I'll just stay there. This same scientist continued, Because of the equatorial bulge and the flattening of the poles, there are four corners, cor- four corner protrusions, one at each pole and two at opposite ends of the strategic equatorial diameter. There's more, and here's what he said. These four corners play a role in controlling the great atmospheric circulation which governs the winds of the earth. And so when we read in Revelation 1 that he saw these four angels standing at the four corners, then really it's not hard for us to understand that the Bible over and over again keeps telling us that the earth is the Lord's. It's his. He has control over it. It belongs to him. He created it. And the four winds of the earth here uh, are really simple to understand it just means the north east south and west winds that's all that is and so what we see here is there's four angels who come who have been by god's design given responsibility to control the earth and that he has created and they bring a pause as it were to this judgment that we've been reading about in revelation chapter six and so the four winds are held back so that the trees of the earth and the sea and all those things wouldn't continue to be in their cataclysmic uh, experience. So the winds of God's wrath have been blowing in chapter 6, and the wrath of the Lamb is falling on the world, and God pauses and tells us about a protection of His people during that time. That leads us to the second point in the passage. The angel who protects from the wrath of God's judgment. That's what the rest of the verses unfolds for us. Verses 2 and following. And I saw another angel. We've already seen these four who have been by God's direction given the command to pause the judgment and the wrath. And now another angel ascending from the rising of the sun having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their 
forehead. So let's think about that phrase, having the seal of the living God. Now, the easiest way to understand this is that this is a seal, like a signet ring, that a king would have that really authenticated and gave authority to anything that he put it to. Remember in the story of, e- of Joseph in Egypt, he was given Pharaoh's ring, his signet ring. And so whatever Joseph said, whatever Joseph did with that ring was as if Pharaoh had actually said it should be. And so this signet ring here of the living God is a, a mark that is made. It's a mark that is given that really shows that this is something the king has established. And so what the king is saying is, I do not want you to let my servants be harmed in this cataclysmic, wrathful time. In fact, I want you to seal them and I want you to protect them. Now, interesting, as we come to chapter 13, guess who has another mark? Uh, you know, the Antichrist. Everything that you see Christ doing in the book of Revelation, you will find that the Antichrist always comes up with his counterfeit. And so that's where we'll come to the mark of the beast and the number 666 and all that. But here's an interesting thing. The mark of the beast is referred to as a mark. This is referred to as a seal. Big difference. You see, a seal speaks of security. A seal speaks of protection of a king. An edict, a statement that no one better go against. Whereas a mark simply is a mark like a branding that belonged to a slave to a piece of property, to a nobody. (laughs) And so what Satan is going to do is he's going to brand his people, but they are nobody to him. There is no protection. There is no security in anything he offers. But Christ is telling these uh, angels, listen, I want you to pause. I want you to put the brakes on. I want you to stop what's going on in chapter 6. And I want you to just for a moment pause and and let my people know something. That I'm going to seal them. I'm going to protect them. And I'm going to make sure that no thing and no one harms them at all. Now notice where he puts the seal. He puts the seal on the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I love this imagery here that John is pulling from. It reminds you of Deuteronomy 6, 8 where the Jews would wear the law right between their eyes on their head. Why? Because it was the reminder to them that God's word, what he had said, should affect their thinking and their actions. And so here, when they're going through tribulations and trials and things are falling apart, cataclysmic things are coming, what they should be telling themselves and thinking in their minds and what should dictate their actions are not the things going on around them, but what the God who owns them, who has bought them for himself, who has sealed them, has said to them so the seal is on their forehead and as we unfold the book of revelation more and more as those cycles keep unfolding and we learn a little more about the story we're going to learn how god protects his people right now we're just being told that he does protect them because the question is who can stand in this day who is going to be okay and who's going to be safe well it's not going to be those who've run from the lamb and rejected the lamb they're crying out let the rocks and the hills fall on us we can't take this But he wants his people to know that if you are in this and if you do endure and experience some of this going on around you, don't let your thoughts be about that. Let your thoughts and your mind and your actions be governed by uh, the words that I'm telling you about protecting you. All right? Now, that's not hard for me to understand. Here comes the real question then. So let's look at the ceiling of the 144,000 and figure out who they are and why they, are they sealed, okay? Let's do that. Now, the, the, the standard answer <laughs> and the one that when I get done in just a minute, you're going to have real troubles with <laughs> is going to be that, oh, these are just 144,000 Jews who have been saved during the tribulation and they are witnesses for Christ, that's the standard answer. In fact, well, I should say that's the standard answer since around the 1900s. That's not necessarily the answer that people always understood that text to mean before. And so I don't think that uh, this verse really, or these 144,000 
represent Jews who are protected and sealed during the tribulation period. Do I think God has a place for Israel? Yes. Do I believe in replacement theology in the sense that Israel has no purpose in God's plan? Absolutely not. But do I believe that these are 144,000 Jews who are sealed and, you know, the rest of us are all in heaven and uh, so we don't have to worry about this because it's all about these Jews who are being protected and sealed by God. Do I think that's what it's saying? I really don't. And I want to show you why. And I'm going to put up on the screen for you a chart that uh, I'm going to kind of just make my closing statements related to. And if you like the chart, uh, just let me know and I'll, I'll be glad to send it to you by way of email uh, later this week. But I don't think these are Jewish uh, remnant believers here and here's why. If you look at these two lists and if you look at the one on your left, that's the list of the 12 tribes from Genesis chapter 35. If you look at the list on the right, that is the list of the tribes from Revelation 7. You just can look at verses uh, 4 through 8 and you'll get this, this list just like that. So already we run into a problem if we say these are the 12 tribes of the Old Testament Israel or they come from the 12 tribes of the Old Testament Israel, we run into a, a real problem because they're not even identical at all. In fact, in the Genesis 35 list on the left and in the Revelation list on the right, what you discover is Manasseh, Jacob's grandson, is added in Revelation 7, but you won't find him over in Genesis 35. You think there might be a reason? You think there might be a, a divine inspiration behind why that Manasseh is added in the Revelation list and left out of the uh, Genesis 35 list? And how about this? Dan is left out in the Revelation list. Also, if these are Jewish believers from the 12 tribes, then why is Levi added in the Revelation list? Because he's not in the Genesis 35 list. Now, this is the point you don't want to go to sleep today, okay? You just don't want to go to sleep right here. Because this is going to be helpful to you as you really unpack and you go, wow, now it makes sense to me who these 144,000 are. And in fact, Levi is added in the Revelation 7 list there on your right, but he's never added in the list of the 12 tribes of Israel in Genesis 35 in the Old Testament because remember, they didn't have any inheritance in the land. Who was their inheritance? The Lord was their inheritance. That's who they had as a possession. So if this was the 12 tribes of the Old Testament of Israel and it was Jewish believers here in Revelation 7, you'd think the list would just be the same, wouldn't it? That's one concern for me. A second concern is this. The sealing of these 144,000 people is on their, we saw it already, their forehead, right? Now could you just, Open your, keep your Bible open there for a minute. Turn back a few pages in Revelation. Look at chapter 3 and look at verse 12. Remember, because we've already said this this morning, the first three chapters are about Christ looking at the churches there in Asia Minor and he is evaluating them and he is encouraging them and comforting them. And I want you to notice what he says in Revelation 3 verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and, will not, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from, from heaven from my God and a new name. This writing on the name here in the church in Philadelphia is identical to the writing or the putting of the name. We'll see it later in Revelation uh, on these 144,000. And here's the question. If, if Revelation 7 is just Jewish believers, then we have a real problem because the same writing on the forehead, the identical uh, recognition of his people is used of the church at Philadelphia. And if you remember, the church at Philadelphia is not just a Jewish church. It has Gentiles. So we have a problem. If we see the same kind of sealing on the forehead in Revelation 3.12 of a church that's made up of Jew and Gentiles, we have a real problem if we think when we come to chapter 7 that these are all Jewish believers. Here's the final and the third reason why I don't think this really is Jewish believers. And uh, then I'll just tell you who, who I think they are, and I think this is where we'll find the encouragement. 
The vision of chapter 7 is repeated in another cycle. Remember we said there are cycles that keep coming up? And this 144,000 show up again in Revelation 14. Now listen very carefully. In Revelation 14, we'll maybe get to it for a few moments just to read it here in a minute. In Revelation 14, in the first five verses there, it says that these 144,000 are purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Now listen to this. And we've already learned in Revelation 5, 9, when he refers to those who have been purchased by the blood of the Lamb, he always describes them as those who have been purchased from every what? Kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. Not just Jewish people, but people from every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. And perhaps even in Revelation 14, verse 4, as it kind of unpacks these 144,000 again and gives us another tale of this story, let's just see a little more about who they are as we get to chapter 14. Maybe by calling them who have been redeemed by the Lamb from every kindred, tongue, and tribe, and nation a first fruits to God, maybe he's just telling us that these 144,000 are just a representation of a larger group of people who are going to come to Christ and he's going to protect. Maybe so. In fact, if you got your Bible still open there in Revelation 7, right after he talks about this protection and the sealing in the first eight verses, I want you just, for the sake of let me just kind of read it and enjoy it for a moment, see what happens as he moves into verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God. You work your way on down to verse 14, and John says, Who are these people? He said, These are those who have come out of great tribulation. <laughs> so it's not just Jewish people. Every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. So, if these are not aliens, okay, <laughs> if they're not seven-day Adventists, if they're not Jehovah's Witnesses, if they are not a remnant of 144,000 Jewish believers who've come from the Old Testament tribes, who are they and why in the world is this order presented this way? Well, let me tell you why I think it is. I want you to notice in the list, if it's still there, what's this? That in the Genesis 35 list, in the right-hand side, who's at the first of the list? Who's the firstborn? Who is it? Reuben. And the left side, which is the book of Revelation, who's at the first of the list? Okay, let me get my mind working right. Okay, there you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, on the left side... I love it when your kids are saying, Dad, it's on the left. <laughs> so on the left side is Genesis 35, and first on the list is Reuben. On the right side is the list of the 12 tribes in Revelation 7, and who gets jumped to the first? Judah does. Now, I'm telling you, that's got to be a reason. Because we've already learned in the book of Revelation in chapter 5 when John saw that that the world was in upheaval and that, that the world was really uh, not the way God created it to be. And he starts crying out and he says, who is worthy? Who is worthy to take these seals and, and take all this back and put it back the way it's supposed to be? And, and, and John is told to stop weeping because somebody has prevailed. And that somebody is from where? From the tribe of Judah. And so in the book of Revelation, John, if we want to know about why are his people protected, well, we've got to put it at the top of the list because we've got a Savior, because we've got a Redeemer. Judah is the one in which the Messiah came from. So here he is bringing right to the front of that list the tribe from which the Savior came. Well, how about this? Notice that the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, which are Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher in the Genesis list over there, are the last ones, right? In the Genesis 35 list, they are the last ones. And they didn't even come from his wives, Leah and Rachel. Where do they come from? Concubines. Slaves almost as it were of the household. They are the outcast. Watch this. In Genesis 35, they're at the end of the list. But they get bumped up six spots above all the rest of the children. 
And why is that? Because I want you to hear this, brothers and sisters. The gospel is a message that a Savior came into the world to rescue a people for himself. And guess what? It was some of the most outcast, the ones that were rejected, the broken and the bruised reed, the one that nobody wanted. He is the one who came to save the outcast. And so in the book of Revelation, we're getting this picture going, whoa, well, this, is, this is really encouraging. We not only have a Savior at the top of the list, but those who come from the women of the outcast are raised up to a position far above all the rest of the sons in the Old Testament list. Now watch this one. This will really, <laughs> this will light your fire here. <laughs> in the uh, left list of Genesis 35, we have Dan. But in um, the right list, which is the book of Revelation, chapter 7, Dan is not mentioned. Who's, who's put in Dan's place? Who is it? Manasseh. A child, it's Joseph's son. Why? Because his name means that he has caused me to forget all my sorrow. All my sorrow. Remember Joseph and all that he went through in Egypt and all the years of suffering and all the tribulation and all the stuff. Uh, he could say in the end, not only did God mean it for good and you meant it for evil, but God's given me some kids, and that one kid reminds me that actually I have forgotten all my suffering. Forgotten all my suffering. You want to know something real interesting? In the Old Testament, Dan, he's the tribe that always led northern uh, or Israel, uh, uh, which is the northern kingdom, into idolatry. And in extra biblical literature that you read a lot of people tend to think that he is the tribe from which the antichrist will come from or comes from leads him away from god rather than to god and so dan is left out of the list in revelation because really god has put one in the place to remind us that all the sorrow all the pain all that you might have ever encountered will literally be gone you'll forget it now if i put all this together Here's what I think the 144,000 are telling me. Number one, they depict the reign of Jesus from Judah. Number two, they include the outcast. That's who's in his family. Three, they exclude the idolaters, those who have gone away from him, those who have rejected him, those who really care nothing of his gospel. They are excluded in the list. And then finally, they remind us of the troubles and trials all being over one day. That's what I think we glean from these 144,000. And it only makes sense to me as I study the book of Revelation in this parallelism approach to where I see that, you know what, first three chapters, this is what the church is like. He's got all these incredible things to correct in them and to, and to really uh, change and purify them in. But he's promising all this coming triumph and victory. Well, who's going to do that? Chapters 4 through 7, the seals start breaking and being opened. And he starts taking back his rightful ownership of the earth. And he brings all kinds of things in the seals of tribulation and trials into the world. And then right as seal 6 is broken and the wrath of God is about to be unfolded onto the earth the question is asked and who is going to be able to stand in this day and here's the answer only the people of God only how he's going to protect them we'll see as the book unfolds but he will protect them he will take care of his people and that is a moment of rejoicing a moment of triumph for these victors they they are looking at this as if to say you know what in the end we really do win we really do triumph we really do triumph well would you uh just let me have you turn forward just a few pages to chapter 14 because it won't be right if i leave this passage without looking at the the further unpacking of the 144,000 in the next cycle here and I want to just have you to in closing think about how we can apply this to our self because really if we are thinking about the promise here in this passage of him protecting his people 
we see in this passage of Revelation 14 kind of how we should live our lives in light of his care and his protection of his people in between the first and the second coming, regardless of what goes on around us. Look at verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads, same kind of stuff. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder, and the voice which I heard was like the sound of the harpist playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. Listen, that means only Christians know the song of the redeemed. Verse 4, and then he begins to describe them. These are the ones who have not defiled been defiled with women, nor have they kept, and for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. Can I just tell you three quick things I think I want you to take home from this if you really are contemplating and thinking about what is it really mean to my life now knowing that no matter what comes tribulation or when God sends his son again and and if if cataclysmic wrath is unfolding and I happen to be in the midst of that and he's promised to protect me until then how should I be thinking of my life and how should I apply this to me number one I think the text tells us that we should be marked by purity by purity. That's what verse 4 means when he says, These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. doesn't mean they're single guys here, because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter uh, 13, 4, that the marriage bed is undefiled. There's nothing sinful about being married. And so the ones who have not been defiled by women is just a way of expressing they have remained pure. And so between the first and the second coming of Christ, one of the things that should grab hold of our hearts is that we really want to be marked by people who are living in a way that is pure and pleasing to God. In fact, doesn't Ephesians 5 tell us that one of the reasons Christ died for the church is that he might present it blameless and spotless. And so we join in with that purpose that he has for his church. 2 Timothy 2.22 tells us to flee from youthful lust. 1 Corinthians 6.18 tells us to flee immorality. And I'm telling you what, it's a culture in which we live in. And I, and I can guarantee you when we unpack the side of the story of Revelation, when we look at the, the Antichrist and the people who follow him, you're going to find every conceivable type of perversion taking place under his reign. And so for us, as the world moves closer and closer to the coming of Christ, one of the things that is going to increasingly be around us is this constant allurement to perversion. And so we make up our minds. We're, we're, we're safe. We're protected. We know it's coming. And we want to be our, have our lives marked by this passion for purity. I love what Robert Murray McShane, the 19th century Scottish preacher, said. It's not great talents that God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. And that is exactly what we got to be aiming for, right? Number two, I think we should be motivated by passion. It says in that same verse, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They are the first fruits from among those who have been purchased to God. In other words, I think that really what's clear here is that when you're purchased to God, you should live a life with no strings attached. It's a no-strings type of attachment. It's loyalty at all cost to Him. And then finally, it says that they are messengers of proclamation. It says they speak the truth because they are blameless. It doesn't mean sinless. It doesn't mean that they never stumble. It doesn't mean that at all. It means that they are blameless in the sense, it's a very sacrificial term of the Old Testament, they're blameless because of a sacrifice that was offered in their place. And so the thing that makes us holy and blameless and right in the sight of God as we even started out this morning in this service is because we have a righteousness which is not our own. And so what motivates us is not only a passion for purity, a really a longing to really uh, be a people who are sold out completely and loyally 
to follow the Lamb wherever He's called us to be, but wherever we go, to make Christ known. To speak truth. To speak the truth of the gospel. To make Him known in the world. So these 144,000, they're not, they're not aliens. They're not seven-day Adventists. They're not Jehovah's Witness. And they're not a Jewish remnant. They're you and they're me. They're God's people. They're God's people that he has promised to protect and to keep safe in the shelter of his own hand. He will hide us, as it were, in the cleft of the rock, and he will take care of his people. That's the promise. Now, when we come back next week, what we get to do is see them celebrating and waving palm branches going, you really did it. You did just what you said you would do. You kept us safe, and you brought us through these difficult times. 